Jesus Christ. From the Acts of the Apostles, our first reading, St. Peter is a shepherd of the beginning of the church, the nascent church, the, the newly born church from the side of Christ. And in this first homily of his, it's very powerful. I'm kind of like cut to the quick as a preacher myself, since he had such a great effect on his hearers. 3,000 people converted in that homily he gave. 3,000 persons were added that day to the church, the body of Christ. Well, what's interesting about that reading, if we look at it, there's a lot of instruction for us that actually corresponds to some interesting questions people have raised. One of the things is that people say, well, let's wait to have our children baptized or our grandchildren baptized when they're older. Let's wait so they're older and then they know what's going on. They realize what's happening. Let's wait for that baptism to happen later. And the other sentiment is that for a lot of Protestant churches, their first move, their first act would be to accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. That's what they would instruct someone to do right away as they start to hear the message of the gospel. But let's take a look at the beginning of the church itself to receive the instruction of what we do. If we look at the first reading, it's Acts of the Apostles. This is the Bible, the Bible, speaking this way. Peter stood up with the eleven and raised his voice and proclaimed, let the whole house of Israel know for certain that God has, been, has made both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, the crowd they were cut to the heart, and they asked Peter and the other apostles, what are we to do, my brothers? What do we do next? Now that we're cut to the heart by the truth, what do we do next? And what does Peter say? St. Peter, the first pope, the leader and overseer of the church, what does he say to them? Peter said to them, it says in the reading, repent and be baptized, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's pointing them to the sacrament of baptism right away. He's saying, repent and be baptized. So he's not saying, well, the next step for you all will be to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Well, you know, that, that must be true, you know, and that's a gradual realization. But the first step he said was to repent and be baptized. He's pointing them to the sacrament of baptism for the forgiveness of your sins. And then it says, for the promise is made to you and to your children and to all those far off, whomever the Lord our God will call. He didn't just say, for the adults among you, this is for you. He said, no, for you and for your children. This is for the children too. Those souls all needed this. So to wait to have your child baptized is actually to go against what St. Peter was instructing the very first Christians to do. Do not wait. Go into that sacrament with that openness, repenting and believing in the gospel, and you're doing this for your children's sake. I mean, it would be ridiculous to say, Let's wait to feed our children until later when they know what's going on and they, they're older and they understand what we're trying to do. We're feeding them Gerber food and all that. We're, no, you don't wait for that. And the sacrament is even more important than any bodily food. It's the life of the soul, connecting with Christ, its bridegroom, and also Savior, Redeemer, through baptism. St. Peter is pointing them to the sacraments. Now, after that, after that sacrament occurs in baptism, for each one of us, you know, that have been baptized, then Jesus becomes our shepherd, the shepherd, and it says in the second reading, guardian of your souls, but it's actually bishop. The word is actually bishop. Jesus is the shepherd and bishop of your souls. And bishop just comes from a Greek word, a fancy Greek word that basically means overseer. Jesus will watch over you 
personally, because he is now connected, you and him are connected. You share in his sonship. You share in speaking with God as father. In the truth of it, not the feeling of it, but the truth of it, which sometimes accompanies with, is accompanied with feelings. Now, with that, what does this mean for us today? Being baptized and having Jesus as the shepherd and bishop of our souls, today in the COVID-19 era, etc., what, what does this mean? For us, as Catholics in general, we will want to have a presence of mind and heart centered on the present moment. There was a writer a, few, a couple hundred years ago, Father Jean-Pierre de Cassade, who wrote the book Abandonment to Divine Providence, which is also translated from the French into a certain phrase that basically means the sacrament of the present moment. This is something to look into now, especially now, because it's been a little quiet for us and we're getting a little restless in this time, I'm sure, and a little tension filled and, and it, it feels listless in a certain way. And then memories come in, bad memories maybe, Maybe good memories, good, praise the Lord. Or maybe thoughts about the future. And the future is, not, is unreal. The future is unreal. It is not there yet. It is not a reality. It is unreal. It is the most temporal part of time. It's not even there. The past, the past is frozen. We cannot change it. We cannot will it away. So we want to be grounded in a place where God is truly present now as the shepherd and bishop of our souls, guiding us towards our own personal salvation and bringing others with us in a train towards his presence and the dwelling of God in beatitude in heaven. The, the sacrament of the present moment is where we really ought to focus because the past, if you know your memories have come up, I'm sure, at times, Bad memories, maybe, and they bring with them all kinds of anger, resentment, regrets, all kinds of things. But again, we cannot change it. And it's good to look at the past, because I wouldn't tell you to focus on the present moment and forget everything else in the past. No, no. Say, say you've learned, you know, even as a kid, that ice on a sidewalk will make you slip, because you slipped one time on it, and you're like, okay. And the next few steps, don't just forget about what just happened, that you learn from that and you walk more carefully. That's the kind of prudence that you can use the past and those memories for, to inform your present to make better decisions than you did before. So you can look at your past, but don't stare at it. Don't stare at your past. Do not stare at it. It will bring up all kinds of anxieties and angers, resentments, and we hang on to those resentments. We look at them. We stare at them. And... It's like old leather. Sometimes we like some of the feeling of justice that we have and the bad feelings we have about looking and staring at the past. You can look at it, but don't stare at it. Look at it from, from a higher perspective. I'm learning wisdom from my past. And then the future has the dangers of anxiety. We can think ang anxiously about the future. We can say, oh, you know, this is probably what's going to happen, and what are we going to do, and what, about, what are we going to do about that? What are we going to do about retirement and paying for college and all these things for our kids? That will bring all kinds of anxieties that don't belong in our heart either. We should look and plan, but don't stare at the future. You can look at the past and look at the future, but don't stare at either of them. It's not healthy. The sacrament of the present moment, because the present, as C.S. Lewis said so well, he said, the present is lit up with eternal rays. It's lit up. That's where God's presence is for you and me now. And now is all we really have. <laughs> Today is all we really have. And this is where God is calling us to follow his will. And that's, me, that's what it means to be holy. That's what it means to rest in his presence. Even in prayer, I've done some uh, instructional videos on prayer a little bit, on meditation in prayer. And meditation is one of the harder forms of prayer because this can happen is we start to think about the future, think about the past a little too long, and we start to stare at both of them, and it pulls us out of the present moment in our prayer away from God's presence. So we want to be very careful with that. 
and be rooted in the present. What we can do to help focus on the present is to take a stock of what's around us even at the moment. Because we are receivers of God's presence. We're not, we don't make it. It's, it's, he is there for us. So take an account of what's around you, the sounds, the smells, where you are, what you're doing, calling that to mind. It can even help in parenting. You know, it can even help in like, all right, let's just, what's the problem right now? Okay, let's fix the problem right now. Let's, let's do the reconciliation here. No, don't dwell on the past. Here's where we are and we'll move forward, okay? Now is where we focus. The present will bring us into God's presence and there will be his voice that we will be able to hear. He's shepherding us all the time. He's trying to. But we can't hear his voice because we're staring at the past and future way too long, way too much. The now and the, in the present moment is where we want to focus. And right now, those watching a live stream and those um, helping with the liturgy here, we are doing the most important thing we ought to do in worshiping God, giving him glory, bringing life to the church, and also for the salvation of souls. And a miracle is happening now. God's presence will be made in a few moments present on this altar. And in the sanctuary, which represents heaven, he will come down and he will be there for us. And the miracle will be made present, even though in this time right now, the temporary time we're in, we won't be able to receive him sacramentally in Holy Communion. The miracle is still made present in the now, in the present moment. He is made present. When his, he's present, powerful things occur in our souls if we are ready and open in the present moment, knowing he is present there for us. And that the sacrifice of the cross is made present to us in the separation of blood and body represented in the appearances of, blood, of bread and wine. But truly, through that beautiful miracle of transubstantiation, he is truly present there on the altar to rest in his presence, to long for union with him. Those are very good prayers because right now, the will of God for us has us in that state right now of longing for him. And the, the more that longing increases, the, the more beautiful the reunion will be. Just think of a, about a married couple, one's maybe across an ocean, and they're longing to be with each other. And then the day comes, and they see each other at the airport, and the hug and the kiss are more filled with passion and joy that they are now together. That is what I pray for you, my flock, also, as a spiritual father, to have that kind of jubilation, that joy at union with him in the Eucharist. Let us focus more on the present moment now, not focusing too much, don't stare at the future, don't stare at the past. You can look at both of them, but to be focused more on the present moment. This is where God is made present, where he is for us now. And to learn from him that way, since he is the shepherd and bishop of our souls.